All right, we are going to continue talking about this um, genetics. We are going to start looking more about these inherited traits, though, these characteristics that we can inherit. Lisa. Um, and so what we need to do is actually talk about who we consider the father of modern genetics, the father of, of what we understand as genetics today, who's led us into... Uh, no, um, who's led us into this, this understanding that characteristics are inherited generation after generation and how they are actually inherited. And so who we consider the father is Gregor Mendel. This is chapter 14. Gregor Mendel was a monk. He was an Austrian monk that actually was very well studied. He, um, not only was he a monk and did all of that stuff, but he was trained also by a botanist, an incredible botanist, and also by a physicist. And so he learned how to maintain gardens and plants and, and things like that from this botanist that trained him. But he also learned how to do a lot of quantitative and qualitative work through the physicists that trained him. Yes, he was. That's it. Okay. So what Gregor Mendel has done or contributed to the scientific community was this understanding of genetics. He, um, at, his, at the time that he lived, it was like the mid-1800s or so that Mendel was doing a lot of his work, there was still this you know, misconception about inheritance. We talked before about how they thought that a whole human being was in the head of the sperm cell, remember, and that the mother was just the incubator. And while they kind of pulled away from that theory, you know, and realized that, well, no, the mother does contribute some to the um, genetic makeup of the, in, of the offspring. They didn't really call it genes or genetics or anything at the time, but that's what our understanding is. Well, during Mendel's time in the 1800s, there was the thought or the belief that things were passed on to your offspring in a form of blending. Characteristics were all blended together. You were just a mixture of your parents. And the expression was a blend. And that's why you kind of look like your mom and kind of look like your dad, but you're really unique because of this blending. Well, if blending actually was to take place, eventually we would all start to look alike, wouldn't we? We'd all blend together and kind of become all one, you know, just like blend. Hmm? It's like the Atlanta show. Pictures of the three people. Yeah, it takes the pictures of the two celebrities and what their children would look like type of thing. You know, we blend them together. Um, there, well, there's, after so many decades or centuries, it would dilute all to become the same the same pot. We'd all, you know, if you've got a white horse and a black horse that blends to a gray horse, then all you're going to have are gray horses from then on out. You know, you're just blending them together and together. But that's not what the belief was, okay? So what Mendel did was he started not actually trying to prove this blending theory wrong, but in a way he did. Um, he was a botanist. He was a monk. He couldn't do a lot of talking, okay? He was kind of in prayer or in his own world his entire day. And so he developed this garden. And in his garden, he grew all kinds of different things. And the one thing um, that was great about his garden was that he, also, he grew what we call snap peas or, you know, garden peas. And he utilized the garden pea in his experiments because he had the ability of manipulating it, that he could actually self-pollinate these garden peas, meaning he could, it didn't need two separate plants in order to be pollinated. A lot of plants reproduce sexually where, you know, um, the piston of one has to be carried by a bee to the stamen of another one, and, you know, we have all this mixing from plant to plant to fertilize. Well, the garden pea was fertilized like that, but it also could fertilize itself. And so this is what helped him develop an incredible experiment. 
But before we move on into what kind of experiments he did with this garden pea, let's go through a little bit of terminology. We have to kind of touch on some terminology. We already know our chromosomes exist in pairs, in homologous pairs. Um, and we already know that the, there are genes on our chromosomes, and our genes are located at a very specific locus. Okay, So we have this terminology down. Well, on our chromosomes, where our genes are located, we have two of every chromosome. Those are our homologous chromosomes. The locus is the location of those genes. Well, those genes can actually have various characteristics. And these various forms of those genes are known as alleles. Okay? And our alleles now are basically, from Mendel's work, considered to be either dominant or recessive. And the way we express dominance versus recessiveness is capital letters versus lowercase letters. So I may have a dominant allele on this chromosome at that locus, and I may have a recessive allele on this chromosome. Or I may have a dominant allele on this chromosome and a dominant allele on this chromosome. Or I may have a recessive allele here and a recessive allele here. So I can have the same kinds of, of alleles, or I can have two different alleles. But you can see that these are at the same locus on each chromosome. So alleles are various characteristics of that gene, or various expressions of that gene. It's still the gene for... Um, yeah, I don't want to use that, though. For eye color. Well, no, I don't want to use eye color. For pea color, or for height of the plant, or for, you know, color of the flower, or something like that. The reason why I don't want to use hair color, or eye color, or height for humans, or, you know, um, things like that is... When the research that Gregor Mendel did and the research that he gave us, he gave us what is called dominance or simple dominance or complete dominance, simple or complete dominance, okay? And in his work, every gene or every allele that he looked at, every trait that he looked at, was going to express this complete dominance. Now, hair color and eye color, it expresses dominance. We know that dark hair is dominant to light hair. Dark eyes are dominant to light eyes. But his research dealt with just one gene. Hair color, eye color, height, things like that, is a multitude of genes. And so I can't just say, yes, you're dominant, so you're going to have dark hair or you're you're recessive, you're going to have light hair. There is a multitude of genes associated with it, and that's why you've got the black hair, you've got the, the lighter brown hair or the darker brown hair, the auburn-looking hair, or the strawberry blonde or the blonde or you know the sandy blonde. And you've got all of these shades now of hair color because there's many genes associated with it. A lot of the changing of hair color, a lot of the changing of eye color over the years has a tremendous amount to do with, with hormones and the multitude of genes. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. My father had the blondest hair up until he was about 12, blonde, curly hair. And now he's got, well, gray, but brown hair, you know, dark brown to brown hair and with his gray running through it. It happens. Um, my hair is very dark. Before I had kids, it was probably about the color of Sarah's hair. I mean, it was literally, it was very, I had these, I had major blonde streaks that would show up all the time. I had, I actually had five colors of hair. <laughs> so it was just, and now it's just all black, <laughs> you know. Hormones have changed that from the kids. It got darker and darker and darker. But it's because of the multiple, multiple of genes being expressed, you know. So... Huh? Eyes can do it too. A lot of times, um, hormones and moods can change the color of an eye. Um, if you have, 
have blue-green eyes, and then like three or four years old, they start to just get darker and darker. Um, people with real light eyes probably get bluer with different moods and darker, like a more dark gray or something with, with other types of moods. It just, it's a, an influx. Some have one brown, one blue eye, you know? It's not going to get light. Yeah, it doesn't get lighter. I wonder why. Interesting. Yeah. No, it doesn't get lighter. The more dominant genes come out. Okay. So Mendel's work was not really, he was looking at just one trait, one expression of a gene, not a multiple of expressions. And that was the good thing because if he was looking at multiple expressions of genes, it never would have worked. He never would have given us the information that he was able to give us. Simple dominance or complete dominance is when one allele shows complete dominance over the other. One allele completely overshadows the other allele. And that's what Mendel's work did. He worked with this garden pea, and he was able to look at different traits. Didn't call them genes, didn't call them alleles, didn't call them, you know, anything other than traits or characteristics expressed on that plant. Now, the traits that are expressed, the traits that you actually see, the characteristics that are visible are known as phenotypes. The phenotype is the actual physical appearance of these alleles, of these characteristics. What do you see? Everything on a person or on a dog or on an elephant you see are phenotypes, the expression of their genes. The physical appearance, I always think physical phenotype, what you physically see. And it's easy to say what your phenotype is. My phenotype for hair color is dark, okay? It's easy to see what your phenotype is. What's not as easy to, see, to know is what we call our genotype. The genotype is the actual expression of our genes on our alleles, hence genotype, gene. What alleles do we actually have? What is on our gene? What traits are being expressed on our genes? Okay. So if we look at these three different examples I have up here, I have one allele with a big A. Well, actually, let me do, should have done the Bs first. I have two alleles with a big B, okay, capital B. This or the two alleles with the small d. Both of these are the same. Each allele is the same. And what did I say before that meant the same? Homo, okay. Homogeneous or homologous chromosomes are the same chromosomes. Well, these, because they are the same, are said to be homo, once again, the same, but there's homologous or homologous, if I put it all together. Homologous, the same. Homologous means the same. And if it's two capital Bs, then it would be homo homologous or... I just totally screwed that up. It's not homologous because those are chromosomes. So scratch that out of your notes and say homo zygous makes more sense. I'm like, homo homologous dominant? That's not right. Homo zygous. Homo zygous. Okay? So the two capital ones would be homo zygous dominant, and the two lowercase ones would be homo zygous recessive. Okay? And now, if I go to my big A and my little A, these two alleles are what? They're different. So they're going to be heterozygous. Now, I don't need to say heterozygous dominant and recessive, do I? Because hetero itself means different. And I know if it's heterozygous, I've got one that's dominant and I have one that's recessive. Plain and simple. Heterozygous. Okay? When we are looking at physical characteristics, when we are looking at the phenotype, we don't necessarily know if we're homozygous dominant 
or heterozygote, or net maybe even homozygous recessive. But quite often, the homozygous recessive, we can tell. Let's go through some simple forms of inheritance that we can describe like this. Rolling your tongue. Who can roll their tongue in here? Okay. How many can roll their tongue? How many cannot? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, you can roll it. We got five out of 18 that cannot roll their tongue. If you cannot roll your tongue, you are actually homozygous recessive. You know what your genotype is because it is a recessive characteristic. Rolling your type tongue is a dominant characteristic. And so when you can roll your tongue, like myself, what's my genotype? It could be heterozygous or it could be dominant. I don't know. I don't know. Why don't I know? Because that dominant allele in the heterozygous condition, when we're talking about complete dominance, is what Mendel figured out, that this complete dominant allele or this dominant trait, this dominant characteristic, overshadows that recessive allele, kind of hides it away. Um, detached earlobes, having little earlobes that you can actually put an earring in or having your earlobe attached to the side of your, your neck. Detached earlobes is dominant, attached earlobes is recessive. Who has attached earlobes? Farrell, you have attached earlobes. Who else has attached earlobes? You have attached earlobes. No, you have detached. You detached, detached, detached. Who has attached earlobes besides these three, three up here? Hers are detached. Mm -hmm. So we got three with attached earlobes, and the rest of us are detached. Okay? Detached is dominant. You guys know what your alleles are. You are homozygous recessive, okay? The rest of us are either heterozygous or homozygous dominant. Here's a fun one. Clasp your hands together, okay? Just naturally clasp your hands together. If your left thumb is sitting on top of your right thumb, it's dominant. If your right thumb is sitting on top of your left thumb, it's recessive. And if you switch your hands, it feels weird. Switch your hands the other way. Doesn't make a difference. Switch your hands and it feels weird. Who would have thought that the way you clasp your hands is genetically determined? It is genetically determined. I can tell you for a fact that I know what my genotype is. I am left over right, so I am expressing the dominant allele. Okay? So I'm either homozygous dominant or heterozygous, aren't I? If you go right over left, you're homozygous recessive. Okay? So I'm either homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Well, how do I know what my genotype is? Anybody want to take a guess of how I would know which one I am? I'm sorry? No, it has nothing to do with what hand you write with. What is a way to figure out what my genotypes would be? I go left over right. I'm dominant. I express the dominant characteristic. A lot of them. <laughs> yeah. But how do I know what my genotype is? By knowing what my parents and what else? Go the other way. Go the other way. By knowing what my kids are. Okay? My parents both clasped this way. Okay? But two out of my three children clasped this way too. But the baby, he goes right over left. What do you think my genotype is if my son is homozygous recessive? You should be able to figure it out whether my husband. I have to be heterozygous. It doesn't, even without knowing what my, my husband goes left over right also. He's, I can. Right, but what I said was my son is homozygous recessive. My son clasps left or right over left because he'll sit there and he'll put his fingers together and he's, he's, let me give him, let's see a letter. 
He's recessive. So in order for him to get two recessive alleles, what do me and my husband have to be? We both have to be, oops, what am I doing? He? We both have to be heterozygote because in order to pass it on to our son, we had to pass on both recessive alleles. Okay? It doesn't disappear. Um, what's another one? Um, widow's peak. I have that too. Widow's peak is dominant versus a straight hairline. Straight hairline is recessive. Okay? Sarah's got a nice straight hairline there. Different. That is genetic. It is a recessive trait, but it's linked to the X chromosome. We'll talk about that in a minute. Baldness. No. We don't show it. You do. Um, it's passed from father to grandfather to grandson. Um, it's passed through. The, it's on the X chromosome. Yeah. Um, the widow's peak, though, is dominant. Cheek dimples. These cheeks, not other cheeks. These cheek dimples here. Okay. These cheek dimples are dominant to no cheek dimples, which are recessive. Okay. Um, big toe smaller than second toe, summertime. Big toe smaller than second toe is recessive. Second toe dominant is longer than big toe is dominant. You go with the one foot that's dominant. Okay, you're a mutant. Yeah. <laughs> Um, here's one that's really interesting, and it's sex-influenced, okay? If your ring finger is shorter than your index finger, that's dominant in females and recessive in males. Isn't that interesting? If your ring finger is taller than your index finger, it's dominant in females and recessive in males. Oh, wait. I'm sorry, ring finger shorter than, than index finger. Ring finger shorter than index finger is dominant in females and recessive in males. That means the male, if the ring finger is taller, that's the dominant case. Look at it, look at it this, yeah, this way. Look at your palms. It's easier to tell. One will be slightly different. Like these two are almost the same size, but look at how much taller this finger is. Okay, the, it's dominant in me, but it would be recessive. It is amazing, but it is influenced by the sex. Males are just the opposite of females. If you have hair in the middle of your fingers, not down here, not on the top, if you, even if it's only on the middle, the middle part, that middle bone, only if it's on one finger, it's only on this ring finger of my hand, that's a dominant allele. Actually, I think it's on this ring finger, too. The kink? On the second kink, the second phalange here, your, your, your middle um, phalange. That is dominant in female, or that's a dominant trait. And if there's no hair, it's recessive. Weird, isn't it? Who can eat green bananas without tasting a bitter, bitter nastiness in your mouth? Like green or not totally ripe bananas? It has, to some people, it has that nasty, tingy, bitter taste, yeah, and others. That's a dominant if that nasty, bitter taste is there, and if it's not, it's recessive. And you can eat those green or slightly yellowed bananas. Yeah, oh, I don't like them brown either. Huh? The ability to smell cyanide is genetic? Really? I didn't know that. Not everybody can say, I didn't know that. That's cool. The ability to smell, well, it's not like I have cyanide around. It smells like almond, you said? Interesting. Cyanide. If, it, if is that dominant, you said? If you can smell it. Allergies are different. There, there's genetic influence in it, but it, once again, it's not simple dominance like Mendel's work. Um, a cleft chin. A cleft chin, a dimple in your chin. Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas, John Travolta, Chevy Chase, you know, that dimple in your chin. Anybody in here have a dimple in their chin, that, that you know, cleft chin? Nobody. You have one? Can't see it. It's, it's hidden. Okay, here's where I'm going to make a point. 
basically everything we've talked about in here that's dominant, most of us have shown that dominant characteristic, right? Like three of you didn't, or two of you didn't, or five of you didn't. Josh was the only one with a cleft chin that he covers up, okay? That is a dominant allele. A do the rest of us are recessive for a cleft chin. Who has it in your family, your mom or your dad? <laughs> your mom? I mean, you can usually tell, <laughs> right? One of them has it. <laughs> it's a dominant allele they passed on to him, okay? The rest of us don't show it. That, you know, it... So basically, just because it's a dominant allele does not mean it's dominant in the population. And that's the important thing to remember, is it doesn't have to be dominant in the population to be a dominant allele. Sometimes with genetic inheritance, like genetic disorders, it's very important not to have that dominant allele. Uh, that are... Exactly. It just all depends. Um, so as we go through these types of inherited patterns, you can actually start doing, you know, like genetic mapping almost, saying, what did my parents have? What do my children have? What could my children have? If I've got this and he's got that, what could my children end up with? There is a good possibility that I could have had a child with blonde hair and blue eyes. Even with my dark Italian background, my father's sister has blue eyes and blonde hair. He had blonde hair until, like I said, he was 12. Um, my grandmother had light hair. My grandmother and grandfather both had really light eyes. My husband's grandmother has, she's Irish. She has blue eyes, you know, her, his sister has green. There was a chance that we could have had an offspring with light hair and light eyes. Didn't happen. But my third child, um, his hair is actually the lightest out of everybody is probably like yours. I mean, it's very light, and his eyes are light, but he's not blonde. <laughs> um, he's not. My middle child had green eyes until he was about two, but those are gone now too, <laughs> fortunately. Well, yeah. I mean, that that goes along with Darwin, though, too. Yeah. I mean, it's just if all you have in this geographical location are recessive alleles then there, there's no way of getting that dominant allele in there, okay? And, but if one bird flies over from somewhere else, it's, it's, all chance. Yeah. it's all chance, yeah. You know, once you have that recessive allele in a population, to get a dominant allele is not going to happen unless it comes in from the outside, okay? Um, so let's look at some of these things that Mendel had done. He was, we have an idea of some of this terminology. In order to, for us to understand all of this, he actually was the one that initiated it. He was looking at his garden pea. And the garden pea just so happened that not only was it self-pollinating, but it expressed seven completely different characteristics or completely different traits that he wanted to look at. He looked at flower color. He either had purple flowers or he had white flowers. He looked at plant height. They were either tall or they were short. He looked at the flower where it was positioned. Either it was positioned at the end or it was positioned in the middle of the stem. Um, he looked at the color of the pea. Either it was green or it was yellow. The pea was either round or it was wrinkled. It was either um, in an inflated pod or a deflated pod, I think. Okay, constricted or inflated um, pea pod. Or one more? Green or yellow colored pods, okay, which produce green or yellow peas. And so he was able to look at these seven uniquely different characteristics. And how he got them to be seven completely different traits was he created what we call a true breeding plant. When he had a purple flower and he crossed it with a plant that had a purple flower, he got a purple flower. And when he crossed it again, he got a purple flower. And when he crossed it again, he got purple and purple and purple. And he did the same thing with white, 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 white. He constantly, no matter how many times he crossed it, he continuously got the same color. Or he had a tall plant, crossed it with the tall plant, got all tall plants, all tall plants, all tall plants. A true breeding plant or a true breeding trait 
basically means you're going to get that same characteristic over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. This is what we consider the homozygous condition. Okay? Whether it's dominant or recessive, it's the homozygous of that trait is a true breeding characteristic. So he took these true breeding plants, and we'll use flower color because that's the easiest or that's most commonly used. And he took a true breeding plant that was purple. Okay? And he's like, all right, I've got this purple plant. I know it's going to give me purple flowers. Every time I cross it, it's true breeding. He was a monk. He had a lot of time on his hands. Then he took the white plant that he knew was going to be white over and over and over and over and over again. And he mated the two together. He crossed the two together. And he's like, all right, if blending happens, what should I end up with? A light purple, lilac-colored flower. And this was basically the basis of his research was to disprove blending because he was like, I don't think blending occurs. After, this is known as our parent cross. He mated the two together. His first set of offsprings, every single one of them came up purple. This is what we call Philio 1 or the first generation, family 1, F1. His first generation... Every one of them came up purple, and he's like, holy mackerel, wait a second here. I had purple, I had white, I crossed the two together. If they didn't blend together, why didn't I get purple and white flowers at least? Or why didn't I get some purple and some white? I had white flowers there. Is it completely gone? Is it lost? Is it forever to be forgotten? He was like scratching his head trying to figure out where to go. So he's like, all right, well, I'm working with garden peas. If I were to self-pollinate this purple plant with itself, okay, not take anything in from the outside, if I mated it with itself, what will happen? And so that's exactly what he did. He took this purple plant and he crossed it with itself. And he wanted to see what the offspring were going to be like. So then he developed his second generation. And what happened? He got some purple flowers, but he also came out with some white flowers. He's like, whoa, look at what's back. Where'd it come from? Well, it was here. It wasn't here, but now it's back. And so he did it again. And he did it again, and he did it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And then he's like, okay, well, what if I took my green plants, my green peas, and I mated them with my yellow peas, you know? And he did it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, okay? Well, he came up with yellow here. I think yellow was dominant. Was yellow dominant? I think so. And then he mated, yellow was dominant, mated these two together again, and he came up with some yellow, but lo and behold, here came a green, green pea out again, over and over and over and over and over and over again. I think he counted. Remember, he was trained by a physicist. Physicists taught him to do quality work and quantitative work. Quantity, the more you do, the more accurate results are going to be. I think he counted over 8,000 peas or something like that. But he was a monk. <laughs> Nothing else on his time, on his hands. But what he ended up seeing was that if he did the height of the plant or if he did the the position of the flower on the plant, or if he did the pea pod, everything, everything he looked at, every characteristic he looked at, this first generation, no matter what, it disappeared. One of those traits disappeared every single time. And then when he crossed it again, what ended up happening was he came up with this ratio. The more he did, the closer to this ratio he got, was that he ended up seeing three purple flowers for every one white flower, three yellow peas for every one green pea, three tall plants for every one short plant, over and over and over. And the more he tested, the more quantity he tested, the more accurate this three to one ratio became. What do you mean what did he do with the offspring? Like after he bred them, what did he do? Did he get rid of them and start all over again? Well, he probably kept breeding them in his garden or whatever, you know, getting peas upon peas upon peas, you know. He was a monk. 
What else was he going to do? No, oh, I'm sure he had them. I'm, I don't know what his scientific procedure was all about, but I'm sure he had it figured out which one was which. I don't know what he did. Go get, yeah. He threw him in the trash can. I don't know. He gave it to the, the goats down the road. I have no idea. But he basically, he was doing these experiments over and over and over again. And no matter what he did, he still came up with that three to one ratio every single time. And he said, well, look, there is no way these plants are blending together. I'm not getting lilac. I'm not getting medium-sized plants. I'm not getting, you know, a, a cross between green and yellow peas. I'm ending up with definitely all green or all yellow and then some green or tall plants and some shorts. And that the, but what he did notice was always in that first generation, the weaker of the two characteristics, as he put it, was disappearing. But it wasn't gone forever. It still showed back up. It still came around in the second generation. It wasn't hidden forever, but it was hidden. Okay? These are the phenotypes. This is known as the phenotypic ratio. A 3 to 1 ratio is the phenotypic, the physical ratio. Physical purple versus white. I actually see that. This is what's happening. Well, what do we know is happening on the genotypes? If it's true breeding from purple, what do you think its genotype is going to be? It'll be homozygous dominant for purple. And if it's true breeding for white, what would the genotype be? Two heterozygous um, homozygous recessive for the white. Well, what do you think these purple are? One of each. One came from that parent and one came from that parent. I'm sorry? And it was a, it's not heterozygous dominant. It's just heterozygous. You don't throw the dominant or recessive on there because it's already understood. It's heterozygous. Okay? So then he took two heterozygous and he mated those two together. Do you know what the genotypes here are? Yeah. What? Okay. Well, this one for sure you know are two lowercase p's. These three here, you know that there's dominance. It's either two dominance or a heterozygote. Okay? but we don't know exactly what it is. Well, here's the way of determining it, which is what um, came out of Mendel's work, known as the Punnett square. If we take this big P and this little P, and we create this little box with a big P and a little P here, then we can say what all four of these offspring actually are. We have homozygous dominant. We have heterozygote, we have a second heterozygous, and then we have a homozygous recessive. What am I doing? Taking this one and this one, this one and this one, this one here and here, and this one and this one. Okay? So we are showing that, well, these three here are all expressing that dominance allele, aren't they? So this is actually that purple color and this one is the recessive white. And every time, no matter what, you're going to get this three, 75% chance of getting the dominant, 25% chance of getting that recessive. Now, here's a question for you. If my first offspring, if, if I do this cross once, say this is you. Say you're mating and you want to give, um, you're both heterozygous. I'm heterozygote for clasping, clasping my hands. My husband and I are both heterozygote for clasping our hands. My daughter, what is the percentage, what is the chance of her showing that dominant allele? Three out of one. She got a 75% chance of showing it, okay, that dominant trait, and she does. What about my middle son? What is his percentage, what is his chance of showing that dominant I'm sorry? 
it's still going to be three to one because I'm starting all over again. I still, she's, he still has a 75% chance of being dominant. And the third one, he's got the 25%. He picked up this one. So if I had another child, what are the odds of it being able to clasp with hands left to right or right to left? It's still going to be three to one. It doesn't matter. Every offspring ends up with a 75 to 25% chance or three to one chance every time. Okay? Sometimes that loses. That goes somewhere that you don't understand. But that is possible. Every offspring has the same chance. Just because I had one that was recessive doesn't mean the rest of my kids are going to be dominant. They got that same one-fourth chance of being recessive just like anybody else. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, these are um, crosses that Mendel did looking at one trait. Okay. This is what we call a monohybrid cross. A monohybrid cross. He was looking at one characteristic, distinguishing it, the, the two one gene, I'm sorry, looking at the two possible variations of that. And always, always, always came up with this three to one. Now, you have to start with a true breeding parent. If you always start with true breeding parents, that first generation will always, big stars, will always be heterozygote. If you start with two true breeding parents, that first generation will always be heterozygote. For example, if I do this parent and I mate it with this parent, my first generation will always be what? It'll always be Heterozygote, oops, missed my C. For every characteristic, and will always show that dominant allele. As long as the parents are true breeding, that first generation, no matter what, will be heterozygote. Got it? This is a monohybrid cross that Mendel was doing here, looking at just P color, looking at just height looking at just flower color, looking at the pea size or wrinkled or round or whatever, out of these characteristics, it was a monohybrid cross, one physical characteristic being examined. This led, this really truly wasn't understood though by his colleagues. Nobody was accepting of his work. They're like, what are you doing? This doesn't make any sense. And the reason why it wasn't fully, truly understood was because there wasn't an understanding of meiosis. We've gone through meiosis. We understand meiosis actually takes these homologous chromosomes, separates them, and creates offspring. Well, Mendel came up with a law after doing this cross here known as the law of segregation. And basically what he said was that, well, during, you know, um, during fertilization or during the development of offspring, these chromosomes will separate out. The chromosomes separate out in forming this offspring. Now, we understand it because we understand meiosis. And basically the process of meiosis allows for the chromosomes to separate. That's literally what meiosis is doing, right? Taking these homologous pairs and separating them. Mendel said that 60 years prior to the understanding of meiosis. And it was 60 years until Mendel's work was actually appreciated too and understood and actually accepted in giving him the title of father of genetics. 60 years before this was actually understood and accepted. Basically, the law of segregation states that chromosomes will separate during the formation of gametes. We know them now as the chromosomes. The chromosomes will separate during the formation of gametes. I think he basically said these traits 
will separate or these characteristics will separate. But we now know that it's the chromosomes that will separate during the formation of our gametes, which is basically during meiosis. Law of segregation. Well, Mendel went a step further. He's like, okay, well, if I'm looking at one trait, what happens if I start to look at two traits together? If I look at flower color being purple versus white, and then I want to combine it with the height of my plant, a tall plant versus a small plant, what will happen then? And so he did this. He's like, I've got two true breeding plants. It's true breeding for purple. It's true breeding for tall. It's true breeding for white, and it's true breeding for short. So he's looking at this plant that was true breeding. One was true breeding for purple. It was always purple, and it was always tall. And the other one he, he dis developed was always white and was always short. Okay, you know what, I'm going to use a different letter instead of P, so it's easier to, easier to figure out what's dominant and what's recessive, okay? So he took these two plants now, he's, or, and he's looking at two traits instead of just one. This is actually what we call a dihybrid cross, okay, di meaning two. So what's this first generation? The F1 going to be? Big A, little A, big C, little A. Will always be heterozygote. Big A, big, little A, big T, little T. Always heterozygote in this first generation. I have two true breeding plants. Always heterozygote. What's my F2 going to be? That's exactly what Mendel thought. A 3 to 1 ratio is what we should have come up with. So, and that's what he hypothesized. Well, if I'm looking at two traits on one plant and two traits on the other plant, I should come up with this three to one ratio. But guess what? That's not what happened. Because following his own law of segregation, these chromosomes separated, but what he didn't realize is that they separate independently. He ended up looking at this, and what he saw in this second generation was that, well, he got some plants that were tall and purple. He got some plants, though, however, that were white and tall. And he got some plants that were purple but short. And lo and behold, there still always was those white, short plants. Now, basically, this ended up saying, well, whatever the second allele was, well, actually, this would be an A and this would be a T because it was the recessive. But whatever this allele here was didn't matter because it was still showing that dominant. And he still saw the dominant characteristic coming out the majority of the time. Nine times he would see that for every three short or white and tall and then there would be three purple and short, and there would always be one recessive. So he came up with this nine to three to three to one ratio. This was his phenotypic ratio. Purple tall, white tall, purple short, and white and short. He didn't see a three to one ratio. And if you go to the law of segregation, well, these chromosomes separate. But after he saw this, he realized that these chromosomes, not only do they separate, but they separate independently. Just this tall or this purple flower was on a completely different chromosome than its tall gene was. And so they were completely random in their separation. If you were to set up a Punnett square for this here, you're ending up with 16 boxes because you have a combination of at least 16 different possibilities. Those 16 boxes, what you have to do is you have to take both alleles into consideration. I can have a big A and a big T. I can have a big A and a little T. I can have a little A 
and a big T. Or I can have a little a and a little t. I've got four possible combinations according to the law of segregation, don't I? And so then my other parent would do the same thing. And so now I'm setting up a Punnett square that has 16 boxes to it. And if you do your 16 boxes, this one here is dominant for both. This one here is recessive for both. And everything else fills in. And if we go through it, here's big A, big A, big T, little t, so that's purple, tall. This one is still going to be purple and tall. This one is still going to be purple and tall. This one, purple and tall. This one, oh, let me grab this. Oh, I need one more color. This one will be purple and short. And this one is purple and tall. And this one is, once again, purple and short. This one is purple and tall. Oh, two capital T's. This one is purple and tall. This one is now white and tall. And this one is white and tall. And this one is purple, no, purple and tall. This one is purple. I lost my colors. Purple and short. And this one is white and tall. And then this one is our recessive, even though it's black, because I don't have another color. But now you can see I have three that are purple but short. I've got three that are white and tall, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that are dominant for both characteristics, and only one that's recessive. Now, this kind of got time-consuming, didn't it? What if he did three cross three? How many boxes would we have? 64, right? Okay, a lot of boxes to fill this out. So it actually got to a point where now there's formulas that help you figure this out, known as the rules of addition and multiplication. But let's finish here with this dihybrid cross. Because he was coming up with this ratio, this phenotypic ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, and after working out all these characteristics in possible ways, you can see that there's 16 possible combinations that we could come up with. He's determined that, well, hey, not only do these chromosomes separate during the formation of gametes, but they separate completely independent of each other. And this is where he was actually the one that gave us the law of independent assortment. And where did we notice independent assortment happening or being achieved? In anaphase 1 of meiosis. During anaphase one of meiosis, when those homologous chromosomes separate, we have accomplished independent assortment. Mendel simply said, hey, these gametes separate, or these, these traits separate, but the thing is, they don't depend on each other. They're separating independently of each other. Whether it's tall or short, it really doesn't matter. Whether I can roll my tongue and have detached earlobes, or I can roll my tongue and have attached earlobes, it doesn't matter. They're on two completely different chromosomes. They are completely different, and so they are inherited differently. And that's what this dihybrid cross was showing, this completely independent assortment, this complete arrangement that had no influence. The traits did not influence the other traits. Any questions on that? Um,
I want to quickly go through just a few little um, ways of determining, instead of drawing this whole Punnett square out, I probably won't ask you this on the test, but um, I can give you some genetics problems if you wanted to work them out. But say, for example, if this is our, uh, our parents, okay, and I want to know what is the possibility of getting an offspring that is homozygous dominant for, for being purple um, and homozygous recessive for being short. Okay? Um, what is the possibility of doing this? Well, what I need to do is I have to look at my, my parents and the rules of multiplication in addition. Hmm? Yeah, this, thing, this being my genotype, well, it's homozygous. Because you can get big A, little A, and still look. Right. Well, no, I want this genotype. What's the possibility of getting this genotype? Okay. Dominant and recessive for the two alleles. What I can do is I'll look at my parents. I have a 50% chance of getting the dominant allele over here, right? And a 50% chance of getting that dominant allele. So one half times one half equals what? One fourth. If I want two small alleles, I've got one half here and one half here, right? Once again, that gives me what? One fourth. So I've multiplied the two together, and now I've got a one fourth chance of getting this and a one fourth chance of getting this one. Together, what's my percentage of getting that? I got a one sixteenth chance of getting that exact genotype in my offspring. Come over here. Two big A's, two little T's, only happens this one time, one sixteenth. Okay, let's do another one. What if I wanted um, my genotype to be this? Once again, to get my two dominant alleles, I have one half times. What am I doing there? Times one half, which is one fourth, right? What about for my T's now? I've got a heterozygote. When you're looking at something like this, your heterozygote, you have to take into account both sides. I could get my capital T here and my little t here, right? Or I could get my little t over on from this parent right? And my big T from this parent. And so now what you do is this we know is one-fourth. This is one-fourth and one-fourth. These two you actually have to add together, which ends up being two-fourths, right? Okay? So now if I've got one-fourth possibility here and two-fourths here, now what do I got? One eighth, two sixteenths. Okay, because we got sixteenths. So I've got two sixteenths all together, right? If we come over here, big A heterozygote for T's, big A heterozygote for T's, what I got? Two sixteenths. Okay? So you see, you can do this. If I gave you three different traits and said, what is the possibility of getting this combination? You don't have to draw out a Punnett square of 64 spots, right? You can simply do the, the rules of addition mean you have, you add these two sides together, or, you know, you multiply the possibility of getting it, and then you add them together, or you, um, rules of multiplication, I'm sorry, you multiply the two sides together, or you can, when you have that heterozygote, you add the two and then multiply. Now, one other way of doing this is you could have done it as two individual Punnett squares, couldn't you? And you know that, well, if I've got two heterozygotes in my Punnett square, I'm going to end up with one-fourth dominant alleles. And if I got the heterozygote in my Punnett square, I'm going to end up with two-fourths, right? If I did it individually and then multiply it that way. You're not going to have to do this. I'm gonna, I have some genetics problems if you want. You're, gonna, you're not going to have to do this exactly on the test, but you may have to 
pull out of a question talking about a dihybrid cross, say what's the possibility of offsprings or something like that type of thing. So there, there are some genetics questions dealing with these Punnett squares and stuff. Um, usually mostly the monohybrids, but there's a few questions I'd like to add on talking about dihybrid crosses too. Okay. when you do the addition and then the multiplying, okay? Because it's easy if you, if, if your parent was this, you know, you got one here and one here and boom, you've got a possibility of one. Everything 100% is going to be like that. But when you're working with, um, you know, cystic fibrosis and if this is my parent here and I'm mating it with this, what's the chance of having a child with cystic fibrosis when cystic fibrosis is of recessive allele? Well, this parent already has it, so they're not having children. But in, in reality, you've got, you've got to work out a Punnett square, right? Well, I've got this child that's carriers, and I've got a 50% chance of having a child that I've got 50% than my chance of having a child with cystic fibrosis. Okay, so this is the kind of problems you're going to need to work out. Um, one other thing that I forgot to mention before in doing this reminded me of it is when we had doing those monohybrid crosses and we ended up with three purple plants and one white plant. Mendel went back trying to figure out where that white allele was. He went back and actually said, well, what happens? Are all these purple plants true breeding for purple? And so out of those three plants, he took them all and mated them again with another plant to determine whether they were true breeding or not. What kind of plant do you, or genotype do you think he would mate that plant with if it was unknown? If I have just a purple flower and I want to know is that homozygous dominant or is that heterozygote, what do you think I would mate it with? 